Data contracts is something you may have heard about, and I'm wondering, what are data contracts? Hey, Simon, Simon Hara of InnoQ. Simon, what are data contracts? Yeah, well, first of all, a uh, data contract is not a contract. Uh, that's super helpful. <laughs> it is. It is about it, 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 uh, think of it like an open API specification, uh, but for data. Um, so it's it's like an offering um, for for data. So it's it's not about a one to one relationship between a data producer and a data consumer, which, which would really um, fulfill the term contract. But it's it's more like the offering of uh, an API, a data API, uh, to others for read purposes. So to some extent, it, it's very similar to an API in, in the sense that it describes something that is made available. And then if somebody thinks that this is useful, then this is something they can start using. Uh, yeah, when you when you think of open API, so it's mostly about uh, who owns the API and then about the well, methods uh, and endpoints you can use and then the, the data format. And <clears throat> in a data contract, uh, ownership is also extremely important. Um, but also the terms and conditions, how can you use it? Um, uh, what, what are the costs behind that? Um, what are limitations, uh, which, which data is not available? Can you use this data for financial reporting uh, or, or not? Um, is, it, is it only where data that's where consent has been collected? So it's not the full picture of all the data you have, but only one have, you have consent on and so on. So it is. it seems to me it is a little richer let's say, a little broader than typical API description languages are. So, so you started with ownership and terms. Um, there are a couple other things that you, I think you could typically say are part of data contracts. Can you walk us through some more things that you will find typically in data contracts? Sure. So next is typically the models, the well, data structure, so to say. Um, that's very similar to a JSON schema. Um, but you, more more richer even. So uh, for some fields, you specify maybe a, an anonymization strategy, or saying this field is PII or this is uh, this has this classic data classification. And then you have uh, reusable definitions. So again, could you could use sim something similar like JSON schemas where you define a, a column or a type and reuse that um, to make. Uh, yeah, things uh, yeah reusable and say I own this definition as as a team and other teams can use that definition in their contracts and signal we use this concept from from the other team. So it's kind of a com component model in some some yeah, shape or form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and more things that we might find. Of course, uh, examples is a little bit different as well. Um, think of this as instead of providing one example, one instance of, of the, the model that you have there, it's more like you have multiple rows because you have the table model conceptually in, in, in your head in the data world. So it's, it can be a much larger examples that define uh, different variations of, of the, the data. But well, that's at least that's something you can do in open API as well. You can have multiple examples. So. But yeah, typically you wouldn't find the same, probably the same richness that you might do that. Yeah, I, I haven't seen like really like 20, 20 examples or so for one, one entity. I haven't seen that really in the API world. But I stand to be corrected. Um, <laughs> uh, next is quality. Um, so think of quality checks. So in, in the end, in the data world, a quality check is something that boils down to one SQL query being executed. And if it returns an empty set, it's green. Otherwise, it's red. And you can specify anything using that. Uh, think of freshness, for instance, and the data is up to date. So you use a time column, a column with a timestamp, and say that this column, there should always be a timestamp um, uh, less than uh, 24 hours. And that you can constantly check. And with that, you can check whether it's up-to-date data and whether there's an issue in the, in the pipeline, whether it has stopped, for instance. That is interesting. Is that something where, like, this will be executed automatically? Is that the assumption is, or kind of the, 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 the meaning behind that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it will actually be ex executed. That's one of the typically used cases. Yeah. yeah SLAs, of course, uh, think of 
yeah, uh, the uptime is not that critical, which is different because data is normally hosted on, on very stable data platforms. So it's less about accessing the data. Um, it's, it's more like this freshness, this up-to-dateness of the data, whether the data is complete. Um, uh, so it's, it's a little bit different here, here as well. Um, That's an interesting difference. You know, to me, it seems like it's almost flipping <laughs> things around from the API space where it's a lot about the, you know, the, the server aspect, right? It's like, is the server up? Like how long, like what's, what's the latency? Like all these very operational things. But then the data that I'm getting, there's very little said about that. And, and here it seems to be yeah. almost the other way around. As you said about latency. So latency is also something in the data world. But it's, it has a different meaning. It means how long does it take when the actual thing or the, the actual business transaction uh, takes its time until it's available in the contract or in the, in the implementation of the contract. And so when, you, when the business event is recorded uh, now, how long does it take to be there? And, and you can measure this. And when you have a, like a daily creation of the, the data under the contract, it's at least 24 hours uh, plus the runtime of the pipeline. So probably mm -hmm. 24 hours and five minutes or so. Yeah. This is that a indeed is a very different idea of latency than it is from the <laughs> APIs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then one last thing, there's also servers in there, but I think that's probably pretty standard, I would assume. Uh, to some extent, yeah. So it's where the data is. So where it's the implementation of the contract is. Um, and in some ways it's, it's, uh, it's similar, but it's not just a URL. It's, um, um, think of when you, when you have the data on a, on, on AWS S3 on a bucket, then of course it's the bucket URL, but you also need to know how it's structured there. Um, what's the partitioning pattern basically you use or what data type format you use to use parquet files, uh, which is more binary column structured why is it JSON uh, um, ND where every new every entry is, is, is in a new line and uh, um, or it's just a huge array and you have to read everything all together so um, yeah okay so it's it's not just the server so to speak it's also a little bit of the physical aspect of how the yeah. data is organized yeah. okay enough to okay. know everything so you can consume it if you get the access Okay. Think of it okay. like that. And now, why are we doing all of this? What What's it for? <laughs> uh, it's not just for fun. Think of this as we always had APIs, but implicit APIs in the data world, and a lot of implicit APIs. And the problem with the implicit APIs was, well, the data producer assumes they can change uh, anything, anytime, <laughs> and the data consumers assume they can um, uh, expect that the structure of the data remains stable all the time. And this is, uh, this just did not work well in the, in the, uh, now, and, um, so, so the goal is basically to bring stability in there, um, to, to, to get this quality assured because we said about quality expectations, we can compare the contract to the implementation and check automatically whether the quality is adhered to. Um, uh, also semantics, so we can describe the structure in a very detailed way in the contract. So you know, is this really the data I want? And not just an order number, whatever that means. So it could be the order number, could be an order number from only that system. Um, yeah. And, and it's about ownership, um, taking ownership over data uh, because a contract has to have an owner. And looking from, I mean, I'm not really that familiar with the data world, so to speak, right? But it seems to me that in a very similar way to what happened in the API space, where there has been a really big movement from centralization to decentralization, mm -hmm. that the same thing has been happening in the data world. Would you say that this is also something that contributed to the fact that data contracts now may be more necessary or maybe something that people talk more about because there is this idea that there will be many who own the data. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about the data mesh concept where you have lots of small teams now, everybody exposes data contracts. Uh, so you have a lot of team boundaries and, and that's where the contracts, the APIs are necessary explicitly in the team boundaries. Okay, and last question. So um, that's more of a concept, right, of a data contract. Um, what's out there? If, if I want to use data contracts, what are the options that are available right now? Mm -hmm. So I would recommend going uh, to two, two specifications. One is the data contract specification um, on datacontract.com. And that's from us uh, where, where I'm heavily involved and also the open data contract standard. That's the standard as part of the Linux foundation. And um, I'm also contributing there, but um, uh, it's, it's a different, has a different flavor. The one is more open API oriented and the one it, is, is a little bit different, but still very interesting to have a look at. So the like, if we just look back at those eight areas that you that you were walking us through, both of these specifications would cover all of these eight, but maybe with a little different focus or flavor or approach of doing that. Yeah, I think one the only thing with the servers, I, I'm not sure whether the open data contract standard is currently supporting. Oh, it, it does. It does. Uh, I stand to be corrected. Just uh, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally agree with your with the observation. <laughs> okay, great. And um, so, thanks for this. I think that's that's all that we need to talk about today to just cover data contracts as a general concept. And I think for us, I mean, the next thing we will do is to have a deeper dive into data contracts and really look a little bit closer at um, how they really work. Right? Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yes, and we'll do that. But for now, we're done with data contracts for today. Thanks so much for being here, Simon. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for watching. If you liked it, please give a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. And until next time, I don't think I can say keep getting APIs to work. I probably have to say keep getting data to work yeah, or something well, like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Take care.